Hi, everyone. I know we have some friends joining us today, but for those of you who don't know me, I am Roberta Mancuso. I have the privilege of being the associate publisher of New England Home Connecticut Magazine. I would like you to welcome you today to the second session for our To the Trade Only Market Day event, incorporating pattern in garden design. I would first like to thank George Sneed and his team at Wakefield Design Center for our partnership. I would also like to recognize Beth Dempsey and her team from Images and Details for their role in helping us bring nationally and internationally recognized design icons to our regional market. New England Home Connecticut and Wakefield Design Center have co-hosted this event for eight years, twice a year, at the beautiful, inspiring showroom of Wakefield Design Center in Stamford, Connecticut where we usually have a full afternoon of sessions, networking, great snacks, close out the day with wine and champagne. <laughs> of course, we're not doing that, but um, adapting to our current environment and with new technology, we have broken up our program into three sessions. Last week, we hosted The Marriage of Art and Design with Lori Weitzner, Lisa Hunt, and our own Quentin Smith. Uh, the final session will be on May 21st, the Life and Legacy of Mario Buada, and we hope that you can join us then as well. No great event can go off without sponsor support. So I would like to acknowledge our sponsoring companies, Heidi Hulser Design and Decorative Work, The Linen Shop, Dean Distinctive Design and Cabinetry, L&M Carpets and Rugs, Alina's Decorator Workshop, and Digital Home Systems. Now typically, all of our sponsors have the opportunity to say a few words during our in-person events, but given our new format, what we decided to do is have two sponsors speak per session. So today, first we're going to hear from Heidi Hulser. Heidi? Thanks, Roberta. So I want to thank New England Home and Wakefield, first of all, for the opportunity to be here. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with our work, we are a highly collaborative and creative group of artisans that create seamless finishes for walls and ceilings. So we work in a variety of finishes. We work in all sorts of plasters, acrylic plasters, lime plasters, mineral plasters, leafing, gilding, glazes, any number of things and any combination of those things as well. So what you see behind me right now is just a small sampling of some of the work that we've done and some of the work that we're scheduled to do. So I want to give you an idea of how these can all be customized in scale, color, and materials. We enjoy collaborating with designers to create a perfect, unique situation for your project. And we can travel nationally. No job is too large or too small. We always finish on our deadlines. And we can handle the job from beginning with the prep to the final finish as well. So if you'd like to see more, please follow us on Instagram at Heidi Holzer Design. And thank you very much. We hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, Heidi. And I, I just, yeah, I do want to acknowledge the fact that we have people from all over New England that are watching us today as well. Um, so now I'd like to turn this over to Liz King of The Linen Shop. Hi. Hello, this is Liz King. Thank you for being here. I want to say thank you to Roberta and to New England Home and to George at Wakefield. We do love being at Wakefield. We miss, you. We miss being there with you today. Um, some of you know us and thank you for your business and support. And those of you who don't know us, we are a linen shop at 21 Elm Street, New Canaan, Connecticut. We have a huge selection of linens for bed, bath and table. One of the things I want to make sure you know about today is the new Matuk Schumacher collaboration. It's just, it's a stunning collection of prints that just layer beautifully. For me, really, the star of the show here is the green, and this is pomegranate. This is the revival of an archive print. For me, it's both modern and traditional, which is really our point of view here at the linen shop. And for this, and like everything else we bring in, we curate a collection of home accessories and pillows. And if you take a look behind me, you can see some of our greens, some of the things we did in a pink coral story. We have lots of blues. We actually have a whole department for blues. So if you're looking for blues, you'll never be disappointed. Um, we do custom monogramming and embroidery. 
uh, we can stitch it about 600 colors. So there's no problem for us to match anything you have. We do a ton of custom work. You'll find we're a great resource for you for installations and photo shoots. We have always have a ton of grows in stock. We have waste baskets galore. I particularly love working on powder rooms. This is the Clarence House draft tiger that I stitched to go on top of a wallpaper. So if you have something you're working on, we'd love to get creative with you. We have a liberal approval policy. We try to make it as easy as we can. I hope you're with us on Instagram at the Linen Shop CT where we are constantly sharing our favorites, new collections, and lots of vignettes. Likewise, I'm trying to load a lot of content on our website. You'll find a tab called The Looks We Love, where you'll see more vignettes of how we're combining our beautiful home accessories with our linens. And that really is the best part of our in-store experience. And we're trying very hard to create that for you virtually. Um, so let me know what you need. I know you've heard me say this before. The bed is the biggest thing in the room. If you're working on bedrooms, if you, if you have bedrooms in your projects, and we'd love to help you uh, work on that. So please get in touch. Email is the best way to reach us and stay well. Liz, thank you very much. So before I turn this over to George Sneed, owner of Wakefield Design Center, I would like to point out the Q&A icon that's at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use that for questions that will be answered at the conclusion of the presentation. And so now, George, take it over. Hello, everybody. Um, uh, thank you again for tuning in uh, virtually. Um, we're all disappointed that we're not doing this live, but this has its own benefits and is also a lot of fun. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, um, we are in Stamford, Connecticut. We're 12,000 square feet. Um, loaded to the gills. I always describe it as retail on steroids. So if you're shopping, we have things in stock. Um, we're delivering um, a couple of rooms worth of goods to an empty house on Saturday. So we're available by appointment only. Um, love to see you. Um, we're, we have presentation rooms, sampling where we're, you know, very, very, um, I'm sorry, adhering to all of the guidelines, but trying to make it as, as easy and comfortable for the designers as possible. Um, we're really excited about this new format and about our, our lineup today. I'd like to thank um, Roberta and Kathy, New England Home, obviously one of our main, main partners in the industry and all of the sponsors. Several of you are, um, have been sponsors for years, several of you are new. Um, we love the collaboration. Um, I would like to introduce um, Carl Delator. Uh, he began his career as a textile designer and has worked extensively in magazines as well as in textile design. He currently works as a content marketing consultant and social media strat strategist within New York's design community. He's the author of several books, The Fabric Style Book, Interior Design Masterclass, On Style, and his new book, Garden Design Masterclass, uh, we're going to be discussing today. So um, I'll turn this over now to Carl and we're looking forward to the presentation. Thank you so much, George. It's a pleasure to be here today. So as George just mentioned, I have a new book that's just come out called Garden Design Masterclass. Um, it's a, an extension of this masterclass series of books I'm doing where I ask 100 renowned design professionals to write about one subject within the discipline. And for this book, it's Garden Design Discipline. We're joined today by two of the designers who are included in the book. Uh, one, Catherine Herman, who's an award-winning landscape designer whose strong horticultural background and intense interest in architecture, as well as extensive travel, has informed her design work on various residential and commercial landscape projects throughout the United States and around the world. Also today, we're joined by Janice Parker, who's a landscape architect, who's established a reputation for conceiving, planning, and installing thoughtful landscapes, and is dedicated to excellent design, full documentation, and project coordination. She's also located in Connecticut and has done work along the Sound, New York City, and in the Hamptons. So welcome, Janice and uh, Catherine. Um, I have a cover of the book. What we're doing today is we, in these uh, conversations we have, we pick one essay from the book uh, that's written by another designer and then dissect it in a little bit of a conversation. And so 
Todd Longstaff Gowan, who's located in the UK, wrote a very informative and thought-provoking essay about uh, a pattern in the garden. And so to begin a conversation, I'm going to switch to, this is a, a garden that's been designed by Todd Longstaff Gowan, and it's located outside London. In his opening paragraph on the idea of pattern, Todd remarks that the recognition of pattern allows us to make sense of what we see and to predict what actions we might take. So I wondered, Catherine and Janice, could you weigh in on your thoughts about how a pattern in the garden is really a call to action? Catherine? Want me to start? Um, you know, I'm really glad that you act, that you picked this particular chapter, to, you know, for Janice and I to react against. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, so my, my chapter that I contributed to the book was on form. And I think that pattern is, well, I should say that form are those objects in a garden that make up a pattern. And, um, you know, I think they, that they can, you know, serve to move you through a garden and um, create the structure, create boundaries, create thresholds and just really enliven a space with their different, you know, different shapes. Um, I think it's what, you know, leads you through a garden, what, you know, what invites you and beckons you to, to, to move about a garden as well. So that would be my answer. And Janice? Well, I'm glad that you brought up Todd as well. I agree with Catherine. And I just have to say on an aside, uh, last fall I had dinner with Todd at a big formal dinner in London. And it started out just a little bit stiff, but by the end of it, he was decorating my hair with the centerpiece flowers. So he was really a, he's a delightful and talented man. And um, I would, I love this because form in Catherine's, you know, such thoughtful gardens using form, she's all, she's creating the forms to create the rhythm. So talking about form, talking about pattern, talking about the rhythm, which is what I talk about. Um, and I think about rhythm a lot is a piece of music in a garden and how you move through it. Uh, and, and working with form, it, Catherine and, and all design, designers are creating the rhythm within the garden. So it, it's absolutely important. You, I think what you really want in a garden is to feel that you're being held very strongly. Um, and when there's a strong rhythm mixed with strong form and pattern, you feel um, extremely uh, at home and should feel extremely at home in the garden. Mm -hmm. and just, to, just to add to that, I mean, yeah, that's great, Janice. Um, yeah, it does give a garden a sense of purpose to have all of those things to, together. One of the things I like about this image in particular is that it is in, in central London. And so, because it's so enclosed and it feels like a room, it has a real clear sense of, I mean, you wouldn't have a clear sense you were in the city unless you look in the upper right hand corner and see the smokestacks. I love this space. So here's another image of a garden in a very different setting um, in Wiltshire outside London uh, in, in uh, England that Todd also designed. And the pattern uh, is these herbs and wildflowers that lead you through the space. And, so to further Todd's essay on, on the pattern in the garden, he also remarks that we gain aesthetic and emotional pleasure from discerning patterns or associating them with particular meetings. And so I wanted to ask you both, if you could tell, talk a little bit about how pattern in the garden might describe a meeting. Yes, you want to start with this one? Sure, so um, how, how pattern in a garden might describe some meaning. Mm -hmm. some meaning. So what I see, and I see him repeating it, is a very classic lesson, I think, that does come from English garden design that, um, and pattern that Beth Chatto would use. And when you walk through a garden, she would constantly turn your eye to the fact that the ridge line. So I'm, when I'm looking up at the sky here, um, and I'm seeing the large trees and, I, and a house to the side, and I'm looking at the pattern, of the, of the view, long view is being repeated in the smaller view closer to you. So she would often point out how you'd take a ridge line, be it a mountain or massive trees, or even your fence in your backyard with your plantings against it, and to repeat it in a bed, and then to repeat it in a pot, and to constantly repeat that pattern again, maybe in the way you lay out your furniture. 
So I, in this, I, my eye is, is of course, absolutely thrilled to have one main piece in the center or to the side of the, um, I'm not sure what it is, um, the tower, the stone folly in the middle of this beautiful planting. And that holds my eye completely because it's being, you know, surrounded with the, um, with the blue sky. And it's the same as I come down into the flowers, the pattern of, of the green and the purples and then the sort of white greens and then the purples at the bottom again. I feel a lot of order even in this kind of relaxed planting, which may not in any way have answered your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> But I see pattern in this, in, in color and in shape. Yeah. I was going to say that, you know, patterning, I think, makes a garden, uh, you know, along with rhythm and along with form, which we've written about, you know, adds a legibility, it, you know, makes a garden very legible, like understandable. And I think that when you're in a space that is legible, there is, I think Janice actually alluded to this, um, that there is a sense of calmness, you know, that you've got this sort of sense of embrace. It's understandable, um, legible, you know, it's not, I mean, at least for me, because I'm, I'm the kind of person that, you know, I love symmetry. I like things that are very balanced. You know, it does give me a sense of calm. It gives me a sense of understanding. Um, the things I find that I really struggle with are alphabet soup. Uh, what I like, I like to use that for, for uh, that term meaning, you know, one of this, one of that, you know, so that they're, I just don't understand what it is that I'm looking at. And, um, you know, I agree that like in this photograph, there is that repetition of color. There is some, there's some linearness, there's some verticality in this image. So I think all of those elements go to making up pattern and, and making it legible. Right, so we're going to move on to an image, and this is a garden that Catherine designed that's included in the book. Um, and in Catherine's essay, as she remarks, she wrote about the idea of form for the book. In your opening sentence of the essay, you write, form gives the garden its sense of purpose, it gives shape, a visual appearance, and a configuration. Form is what defines a space. So how does that play out in this image? In this image? Well, this it's 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 great. I was actually just visiting this client this week, um, so I, I love going back and seeing how our gardens mature. Um, and so, how we use form in this particular garden is we've got a lot of evergreen plant material. Um, we've got a linear hedge of taxis that you sort of see sort of in the background. That's that linear green hedge. Um, we've also got rounded, globed boxwood. Um, so you get that different form of something round. Um, and then we've got the looseness of the two magnolias that are kind of very fluffy. Um, this garden is what I like to call, it's asymmetrically symmetrical. Um, so we're, we're repeating forms, you know, throughout the garden, in, uh, the globes. And, you know, I love that they're offset against something that's very horizontal. Um, and I just think it makes for a very dynamic garden. You know, this garden I love. Um, the other thing that we did is we used allium and the alliums have those rounded heads. So you're, so that's sort of a repetition of the form. It's sort of, you know, mimicking the roundness of the boxwoods as well. I'm curious, is the allium finished or about to bloom in this picture? Cause it's they're... finished in this picture. It's yeah. so beautiful. The forms are beautiful. Thank you. I love how the allium looks like it's absolutely dancing through the stronger, um, you know, firming uh, backbone of the rounded forms. You know, they look like little heads of people, you know, yeah. doing a dance and, and I'm sure they move in the wind and it's, so it's really fun. Yeah. yeah, it's a very, it's a very dynamic garden, you mm -hmm. know, because we do have all this, all this plant material, different forms and shapes and colors, you know, going on in it. So thank you. Great. I'll move on to the next image, and this is a garden that was designed by Janice. And so Janice, again, talking about, Janice wrote about the idea of rhythm in the garden in the book. Um, and in examining that subject, you write, uh, think about how a great piece of music and strong choreography work together to create an unforgettable rhythm, focusing the viewer and creating a full experience. 
Rhythm and timing are strong and important components of garden design, focusing the eye and keeping it there. So how does that work in this image? Well, we were lucky to be able to work with the architecture, you know, to create this curved pergola, which actually has a matching wing on the other side. So you're going to walk through these repeating forms and they, they do, a, a, obviously we've got the, the four types of rhythm that I talked about and uh, repetition. So the form keeps repeating. Um, the uprights, um, the slatted uh, horizontals on the pergola keep repeating. The red roses keep repeating. Um, and they also alternate. So you're alternating side to side in, in both ways, but because of the curve, instead of them being perfectly aligned with each other as they alternate, they're, they're alternating and alternate. And um, it's, instead of lining up, they're alternating. That's good. I got a little bit of a twisted tongue there. Um, and it's also progressive in that you go through the largest element is close to you and it gets smaller as you move away. So it actually isn't very large, but it feels larger because you're watching the dimensions get smaller. And then to play with that, you can barely see in the right-hand corner, we popped it up another two feet, the pergola. So there are two square wings that are higher. So we already got a difference that would, that would happen when the shadows hit. So when the shadows hit in the summer, they're shorter. When they hit in the winter, they're much longer, but they also create um, an element that um, years ago when I first started just surprised me. I had no idea it would happen. And now, you know, I don't do a lot of planning about it because I know it's going to be there, but all kinds of wonderful things happen when you set up um, a structure for, for shade and shadow. And it also, in, in a bit of a way, it's undulant, which is another kind of um, rhythm that moves. You actually, I like, I think undulating rhythm is better in a very large space because you have the room to get, you know, um, movement from wind and get large plant masses that all move together. And, uh, but there is an undulation that we try to create here because uh, it goes around a corner with a curve of boxwood. Uh, but the, the overall lesson, I think, for us when we do this and what we're trying to show the clients is, you know, obviously this is where you walk, right? And as you walk through it, you're going to enjoy this play um, that's going to have a little bit of looseness in the curve. Um, curves and color are a great way to work with rhythm as well, as opposed to, to pure symmetry. Um, and I think that the plants will always soften any geometry that you use in a garden. So your geometry should be pretty strong and exact because once the plants grow in, as you can see here, it, it gets softened and hidden. So they do mess it up. It's like messing up a, you know, a, you've just done your hair and you sort of mess it up a little bit. But it's Give the it. best part. Yeah, that is, that is. <laughs> what I like about this is just like how it's curving. So there's this sense of mystery a little bit, right? You just, you almost want to follow that path and, you know, see where it takes you. You can't quite see where you're going, so. Certainly draws your eye in. And I was curious about how the plant materials are the same on either side of the path, but they're not mirrored. So right. that the roses aren't, and so there's an alternation that's rhythmic as you, as you travel down that pathway. Exactly. So I like to take a module that's maybe six or eight or 10 feet long, depending on the size of the garden, that has its own form and color and then repeat that over and over again as sort of a best shadow thing so that the actual flower border is constantly in a rhythm as well, in a, a repetitive rhythm. And, um, and then if I can get very clever, which I can't always, but if I can get very clever, then I could also run color through seasonally. Right. All right, so let's move on to the next image. When, um, is from my friend Billy Cohen. It's a garden sound um, that's included in the book. But I want to turn back to Todd uh, Gowan for a moment and talk about the idea that he says that sometimes he establishes harmonious rhythms, but also sometimes he likes to disrupt with a door disorienting view. So I wondered what some of the ways you pose um, patterns to create harmony and then maybe patterns to create sort of con conversation. Hmm. So we just talked about that pathway 
realized. So created pattern there that was harmonious. Um, there are other, is there another reason why you would create a pattern that isn't harmonious to jar the eye? So I, I yeah. think, you know, I, I like to not have to think too hard when I'm in the garden. Okay. You know, I like, I like, you know, it's, I'm not going in there maybe for a surprising or fully, um, you know, uh, full experience of, of the, all the emotions. But certainly gardens have traditionally been created to surprise, to scare, to evoke your inner life, to evoke Hades, to evoke heaven, to evoke hell, you know, and to, to take you through a whole range of emotion. And if that is your intent, I mean, certainly in that first picture you showed with the, the sculpture of the stag and then these sort of tall moving patterns, I mean, that evoked an enormous amount of emotion of, you know, trying to remember what medieval scene it might be playing out, you know, and, and what that, that animal figure was representing. Um, and, um, you know, certainly there's, there's an enormous amount of nature worship and, and, and understanding of form and shape outside from Stonehenge on that is nice to evoke and disrupt with and make you, you know, and I think we recognize it. Um, I think an element of surprise can be wonderful if that's the intent. Uh, and if that's what you want. And I do think I see that more in modern gardens than in more traditional garden design. Mm -hmm. And um, I think of disruption in a way when you think um, in a really big scale of the uh, memorial for 9-11 where you go and you stand on the edge of the water feature and it actually goes down, right? It's just not still, it's not flat, it doesn't go up. That is a real disruption of what you're expecting to see. Um, and I think that if, if someone wants that, it's a wonderful feature to have. Yeah. I would say, you know, disruption in the garden or changing a pattern, it can be a really great way to solve for, um, you know, trying to make spaces work together sometimes. You know, if you do something a little unexpected, it's a great way to make that transition, right? You know, especially if it's not sort of, naturally going to happen. So it's a way to, to you know, disrupt and, um, and try to make two things that might be a little bit disparate hang together. Um, you know, what I think I see in this garden or, you know, in this photograph, you know, what's I think un unexpected here that I see are these kind of the rounded, I suppose they're boxwoods um, that are just sort of scattered about in what to me looks like a little bit of a you know, natural setting. So it's so it's kind of interesting to see them. It's not really what you would expect to see, but yet there's a certain, um, I don't know, levity to it. You know, it's a little bit humorous to kind of see them there, I think. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, breaking up patterns and doing things like that, you know, does allow you to, to kind of change the dialogue of what's going on. Right, so and, we'll, and in the arms of the chair as well, it's got a, a kind of curvy, fun, yeah. you know, uh, levity to it. Yeah. So the next image we're going to, this is a garden also designed by Catherine that's in the book. So thinking about choosing forms in the garden, Catherine, what are some of the ideas that a garden designer really should be thinking about? Well, I mean, I, I, I think that it's about setting up structure, um, certainly within a garden. I, I, you know, one of the most important things, and I, and I think I do touch on structure um, in the garden because I think structure is really created by form. Um, so setting up structure in a garden um, because that, you know, a, a lot of what we do is, is about creating outdoor garden rooms, right? Um, you know, giving the sense of enclosure. Um, you know, when you, it's just a fact that when you take a garden and you break it up into smaller spaces, it will actually feel much, much bigger than if you just have a garden that's just sort of wide open with that's not broken. It gives you more places to explore. Um, it just, you know, makes it more interesting. You've got more sort of moments in the garden. Um, and, you know, I just think it, that's the most important thing um, you know, the other thing uh, that, that is very, very important is the relationship from the exterior to the interior of the house. 
and how those live uh, you know, together, how they marry together, and how they interact together. So. I love how you use form in this picture. Mm. Yeah, it's sort of a billowing boxwood hedge um, on either side. Um, this is actually um, two boxwood hedges that are, that are, it's a forced perspective. So they're actually um, getting narrower as they get towards the gate that you see in the, in the distance. Um, and it was a little bit of a visual trick because on this particular property, there was not really a lot of depth. So we wanted to give that illusion of depth. And we did that by making it be a forced perspective to that gate. So this is actually on axes with the sort of the main doors at the back of the house, which come through to the front door, the front of the house, which goes to a gate, which goes out to a road. So it's on this incredibly long axis that um, goes through the property. Beautiful. Yeah, it's beautiful. Is there a pool beyond that gate? There is, there is. Yeah, beyond the gate is a pool. And then beyond that, it terminates with a, a piece of artwork. So. so when is our lunch there? Post-pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, post -pandemic. Post -pandemic. good answer. So we're gonna move on to, this is a, a, a garden um, designed by Janice that's also included in the book along with her essay on rhythm. And so Catherine, turning back to you for a moment, I mean, uh, Janice, excuse me. Um, uh, in examining the subject of rhythm, uh, no, excuse me, I'm on the wrong page. Sorry. You're good. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> can you tell us a, a, a bit of an overview about this image and, and how you used rhythm in this space? Well, I, I mean, in the alternating rhythm of the step stones and the grass joints, uh, that's one of my favorite things to do. I think it comes from um, doing a lot of crafts as a kid. Uh, you know, I like to, you know, uh, every day is just a game of Tetris for me. I just loved puzzles. And uh, whenever I was given a puzzle, I was, it never was a question in my mind that it had to be finished. So um, it's sort of a puzzle to put masonry together for me. And so it, it's fun. Um, so that takes you down and the chairs have a lot of bounciness to them and the, the repetition of the round fireball and the round um, uh, little gravel terrace for it. Um, you know, you can't really get hydrangea to behave, so it's doing what it wants over there. But I think what it comes out to me from this picture, looking at it for the first time in a while, um, is something that I try very, very hard to do. Um, and, and, and I find it very hard to be disciplined. Um, which is to do nothing sometimes. And sometimes what you don't do is much harder in, in, in than what you do do. And what you don't do can really make a design. Um, the, the vastness of the water beyond really seemed to cheapen any garden I'd take near it. So I find that when there, you would do any kind of actual constructed landscape close to a big view like this, be it a mountain, a lake, a vista of water, um, the garden looks quite quite cheap and small in a way. I don't, you know, um, when I say cheap, I mean, it looks very stagey and like filled with artifice. It doesn't look like it belongs, like it might closer to a house or closer to it, it, where the interviews are more important than outer views. And um, the openness of that, um, I often say when I'm working on a site with this much of a pretty surround, that I let myself design everything. And then I take out about 90 to 95%, I might have something, I might have something. So um, we work with rhythm and the curves of the side border, uh, but uh, you know, since that gave a lot of interest to what's going on on the other side of the property, but um, leaving it alone, I actually find pretty hard to do. What I think is interesting is uh, there is the rhythm of the stone leading to the terrace. And then you remark about the hydrangea being um, doing what it wants to do. There's that sort of haphazard sensibility to it that makes me feel like I'm transitioning from a more controlled environment in the foreground to the ocean in the background. I really love that because yeah. it feels we're opening up to nature as you, as you pass through the space. You know, and that's really what I try to explain uh, a lot is that if, if we can get you outside, 
and we can give you an orderly room that you feel comfortable in and you can step out of it into nature, then we've done our job because ultimately our job, I find my job is pretty easy. As long as I don't make any massive mistakes, nature will do most of my work and she'll do most of everything for me. So as long as I set it up and sort of get my ducks in a row, she'll take over. And what I want people to do is love being outdoors, not necessarily love being in my garden. And, and yet they need a place to step through, right? You need to be able to walk through the filter of what you understand into what you don't understand. And, um, and that doesn't have a lot of words or a way to describe it, but which is really quite magical, you know? Um, but having that view <laughs> and that ocean, it's going to make it much easier. People are longing to, to, to connect with that. Um, it becomes a bigger challenge in a smaller space that might not have as an attractive background. Yeah, I sort of think that's our job as landscape designers and architects is to create, you know, if, you, if you're not given something from mother nature, like a fabulous setting like that, um, you know, I view, I think it's our job to create that for a client, to give them sort of a wow moment or, you know, a, a great place to be, something to look at. Um, you know, what I, what I love about this image is that um, that patterning on the ground is so strong that it really does draw your eye out. And I find my eye just sort of lifting and then, you know, I'm taking in that bigger, that bigger view. Um, All right. So one more image and another, and, and one last question before we take questions from the people on the Zoom call. This is a garden by um, Charlie McCormick, which is adjacent to his house in, in England. And um, I love the pattern of all of these dahlias as they travel across the border. Um, the question, with so many people being confined at home in, in the middle of this coronavirus, I've been hearing lots of people have a renewed interest in gardens. Are, mm -hmm. are you having that experience? Are you hearing the same things? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I, I think that, you know, if people are fortunate enough to have, you know, some outdoor space, I mean, it is kind of an escape from, from everything. It's a place where you can, you know, kind of pretend like it's somewhat normal. Um, you know, even though it's, you know, it's not, um, but yeah, I definitely think that people are really appreciating their gardens. I mean, we, we definitely are seeing people interested in moving forward with, you know, doing projects outside. Uh, we're very fortunate here in Connecticut that, you know, landscape contractors, you know, are considered essential. So a lot of the work has been able to go on. Um, so absolutely. And it, it's, you know, I would just say that I, I, that gets echoed with every person that I speak with about people looking to do things outdoors. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And where New York City and New York State has been shut down and we have a lot of clients old and new in, in those areas, um, especially in the city, I, a lot of weekends I've been spending FaceTiming to help people figure out how to plant themselves who have never planted and um, and 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 trying to involve their grown children even who are home from college or just sequestering with them because they've lost their jobs um, and they're out there um, actually career people saying to me oh my god I have found my purpose in life you know and these are people who have never gotten their hands dirty and um, and and it's 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 really um, it's really charming in, in so many ways. And um, community gardens that we, we work with in the city have been slowly opening. The social distancing part has been hard to figure out, but um, by scheduling A and B and C days, they are open and people are able to get into them and start their vegetables and get their things going. And I think that it's all the more meaningful, all the more meaningful and um, and if you are lucky enough, like Catherine said, to be able to have a garden of your own, I find a lot of people want to grow their vegetables and want to grow their fruits and um, are recognizing that a certain amount of independence 
not not isolation um, because certainly we all want that to be over, but a certain amount of independence and being able to be more self-sufficient with what you do have seems to be very important. So interesting you bring that up because right across from me at my window ledge are 40 tomato plants and a dozen basil plants that I started about three weeks ago. Uh -huh. because <laughs> I'm having this idea that, geez, geez, I better get in the backyard and do something. Yeah. And I'm lucky to be in Providence, Rhode Island, and we have a backyard, which sort of is planted. But, you know, I need to feel a connection to outdoors. And my fingernails are clean today, but perhaps they won't be later. Anyway, so, you know, thank you so much, both of you, for joining me today. I'm going to switch to the cover of the book. And then if I'm not mistaken, um, we have some questions from the audience. Okay, ready? Yeah. Okay, um, here's uh, the first question um, that we had received. This is, what are your favorite materials to work with at this time? And I think both, both you can answer this, Janice and Catherine. Do you wanna go first, Janice? Sure. Um, you know, there are a lot of more uh, materials that seem a little less expensive and more modern uh, that we're working with, like Corten steel and gravel instead of hardscaping. And I think that a lot of this is coming because of stronger regulations for uh, how we're dealing with stormwater and groundwater. So we constantly want things to be permeable and, um, and, I, and not have a lot of concrete and a lot of steel in the ground. It makes it less expensive to do these things and they're more user friendly. So we're doing a lot of that, gravel paving instead of stone on top of concrete pads, um, edging out of less um, materials that need less footing, less, less um, impact to the ground. Um, and I think anything that has a bit of a clean and sort of chic look to it is um, very popular, sort of going along with a lot of the taste in interior design. Okay. Catherine? Yeah, we um, materials that I like, you know, tend to be um, things that are a little different. Um, we've been using a lot of decomposed granite. Um, that can be a very soft um, material for paving, um, for, for pathways, or maybe even like a little terrace. Um, you know, have to be careful about where you use it, um, certainly, but, you know, there is a certain softness to it as opposed to bluestone. We certainly do hear quite often from people um, that, you know, bluestone can be kind of hot underfoot. Um, so, but, you know, it does sort of, bluestone does fit the vernacular here in, in the Northeast. Um, so I do think that there is a certain validity to it. Um, we also do a lot with reclaimed granite um, for paving. That can be really beautiful. It comes in, it's got this just very beautiful patina and, um, you know, sort of like how you lay it, you know, in patterns on the ground, you know, can be limitless. Uh, you can, you know, you can get them in planks and it can be done sort of in a herringbone pattern. Um, so it can be really elegant and beautiful, but yet casual because it's kind of got that sense of age to it. Um, I mean, the other thing I have to say is without saying is plant material, love working with plant material. And I think we're trying to be a lot more inventive with, you know, combination of plants especially perennials um, and how we set up perennial gardens for clients. So. Oh, that's great. Um, let's see, what else do I have that came in here? Um, in an outdoor living space, um, as both of you, you know, talked a little bit about, um, someone would, would like to know, when does furniture come into play? I can, I'll start with that. I would tell you from the get-go from the second that we're doing a schematic design, we are thinking about how it's going to be furnished. Um, you know, just as part of what we do, we actually do or can supply outdoor furniture for clients. Um, but it's so important to go ahead and think about the furniture because it's for space planning. So it's a way to also test that what you're designing is going to actually function um, in a way that you intend it to, and that it's going to accommodate you know, the number of people that you hope that it will. And, and um, so it's very important. I couldn't agree more. And, and sometimes it's very hard to get people to understand how they're gonna use the space or furnish it, even though it's so easy for them 
to, un I mean, they may get an interior designer, but it's still easy for them to understand what a living room holds, what a dining room holds, what they want in their kitchen. But when you start talking about outdoor spaces, they can be very unsure of what they want and, and where they're going to sit and where they're going to move. And um, we obviously don't want to create more terrace than they're going to actually furnish because yeah. it can be bleak. So um, I usually ask people to start with a really, really good table and put it somewhere where they're going to enjoy looking at it. Because, I mean, there's, there's thousands of chairs, but good tables are hard to find. Okay. Which sort of leads to the, the next question, um, which is a little bit more, I think, about process. Sort of, um, are you typically hired in the beginning of the process along with the architect and the builder and the designer on new construction jobs? Do you all sort of come together so it's all integrated? How does that typically tend to work? Well, that's ideal. <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, that's ideal. Um, it's a long process and, and a lot of planning, but it's an ideal way to get a great team project um, all the way through. There's nothing harder than going, for me, than going into an old existing landscape that needs to be renovated and redone. Um, there are just, especially if a client has lived there a long time, there are just so many complications there. You can end up with something very beautiful, but it's extremely complicated. A new process, it has very few restrictions, except regulatory, right? It's a, it's you a, can do anything, which is great. It's a clean slate. Catherine, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I would absolutely 100% agree. It is really great to be brought on early. Um, I would say that you know, people, you know, the professionals that get brought onto a project, you know, you're giving them the opportunity to dialogue with one another and come up with the best solutions. Um, you know, we've, we've been working on a project um, in, up in Litchfield County, and we've been working really closely with the architect to actually site the house. And, um, you know, the architect had one idea and we had another, and we've done this back and forth and the house site has changed I think three times, um, but I think it's for the best. I mean, I think when you go to make an investment like that, that it is really important to, you know, get everybody involved, you know, make sure that everybody has a say and a place at the table. And, um, you know, that way, that's how you just ensure that you're getting the best possible sort of outcome. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, what do I have here? Um, what are some uh, current trends that you're seeing in residential landscape architecture today? Let me start. Um, we, you know what? We've seen, um, I think a lot of clients like living outdoors. Um, we have a pretty short season here. Um, so, you know, we've been, definitely been doing a lot of outdoor fire features. Um, not fire places, but fire features. Um, and, you know, that's been great. Certainly a lot of the manufacturers have come up with some really cool um, fire features that you can buy and install. And, um, you know, it gives people a chance to sort of gather around, you know, maybe to have a drink, uh, you know, before dinner, or if it's just a little bit like chilly out, you know, you get to sit around and socialize. So I think um, that's definitely been a trend that's that's been going on for a while. Um, you know, I think swimming pools continue to be, you know, quite strong. I think now, especially with people being at home more, I think there's a, like a definitely a renewed interest in, you know, trying to keep your, um, you know, your outdoor, you know, living um, like at your home. So. No, I agree. I mean, I, we touched on the fact that certainly pandemic wise, we're being asked for to help with a lot of vegetable gardens, um, outdoor cooking, outdoor kitchens. Absolutely. People want to get outside. And um, one of the key phrases we keep hearing from everyone, and I think it's really part of the change that the Highline brought into our focus, um, is, is meadows. And meadows are challenging. And not for everybody, because of course they want a meadow, but you know nobody wants ticks. So it, it is it is um, a challenge, but can be handled pretty well. I'm actually putting one in for myself, so I'll let you know how that goes. Okay. Um, and um, I really think that the disruption for an existing landscape to add lighting, though many landscapes need it, is very difficult. So we use a lot of 
these beautiful, there's so many rechargeable lights available now, LED rechargeables that can look like lamps, they can look like candles. You can even just go to Bed Bath & Beyond if it was open and uh, you could get the uh, battery operated candles that, that are actually absolutely charming outside and inexpensive. And adding light in an easy, simple way without having to dig up your entire garden um, and getting light where you want it um, really can add, really add a lot of atmosphere. Mm -hmm. I find I love the outdoors at night because I don't have the need to pull all the brown leaves off or weed anything. Just the overall structure looks gorgeous. The light is flickering and, um, and the atmosphere, you know, is wonderful. But often people just don't have enough light or they have security light. So I would really think these um, rechargeables are, are very helpful to get people outdoors. That's a great tip, thank you. Um, last question, what advice do you have for young aspiring landscape architects looking to work their way up? Janice, you wanna start or you want me to? I have three words, train, train, train. <laughs> <laughs> Training, training, training. Uh, you know, there is, um, Martha Graham used to say, right, that it took 12 years to make a dancer. And I think it, it, that it's absolutely true that you can fall madly in love with something and want to do it. And, and you're obsessed. And that, I think, is a journey that is close to 12 years. As you fall in love with it, you start to understand how you'll do it. And then you hopefully fall in love with how you do it. And then I think you've got another 12 years to actually master that. So mm -hmm. I don't, when I say that to younger people who come in and intern, they're crestfallen because they've done four years of college. What more do you want of them, right? But the thing is, is that the, it's the, you know, the, not to sound prosaic, but it's the journey. It's the journey that counts. It's just the journey that counts. Um, it's just a series of progressing, never getting there and an understanding that you stay completely with an open mind. And, and you, you, you know, I spent all my free time in nurseries and all my free time in gardens. Um, and certainly there are people who don't and become outstanding professionals, you know? So there are so many facets to landscape architecture yeah. that you can be in and so many really purposeful, meaningful ways to help others as well as just you know, to not just, but as well as design, there are incredible um, governmental and, and municipal um, positions uh, where people can really affect change. And I see that in so many young landscape architects. They want to design, but they really want to create a better future for themselves and others. And, um, and that's very encouraging. And also women are the largest uh, group by gender, graduating landscape architecture school now. And um, I also find that interesting and encouraging. Okay. Yeah, I would just add to that. I, I don't think, well, I like what you said about, you know, that there are so many facets to it. Um, you know, be it plant material, be it hardscape, um, just design in general. I mean, I think it's really important to be a sponge and to want to learn and be interested in, in a lot of the different facets. Um, you know, I think that's how to be somebody who's really well-rounded. And I think if you've got that well-rounded, um, you know, training, that that is just simply going to make you a better designer. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because I think people who come out of landscape architectural programs sometimes don't really get the training in plant material that we would wish for. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I love it when people, you know, take an interest and go to a nursery to see, you know, how plants perform, or maybe they have a garden of their own, um, you know, so they can exper experiment um, because there's kind of no better way, certainly, to learn about plants than having your own garden. Um, but, you know, I'd say, you know, working for, for different people, seeing how different firms operate uh, also is, you know, would be very valid. Okay. I had a farmer tell me once that even though he was an old timer, he'd been farming for 30 years, he had only actually farmed 30 times. <laughs> because you only have one season to figure it out, right? So when I meet people and say, well, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years, I'm like, 
you've had 10 springs only. <laughs> and you don't know how bad it can be. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things like, you know, Catherine said, just be open to it because it, it is a year round profession and you only really get 10 of those in 10 years. Whereas if yeah. you're doing something else, you're designing a book or you're working on a piece of furniture, you know, you might do 40 or 50 in a year, you might do 60. Um, but you're not going to get that many springs. Ah, Very interesting. Very good. Uh, good observation. So um, I, I think that's the last of the questions. And before I turn it back over to George, um, just to remind everybody, the Garden Design Masterclass book by Carl Delatour is for sale. So if anyone is interested in purchasing it, let us know. I know that we have a link, I think, with Elm Street Books. Um, but you can email us and we'd be happy to get the book and um, we'll figure out a way when Carl can do a signing in person. Well, and, and, and to add to that, we have these um, Rizzoli book plates. Okay. So if you, if you ended up buying a book and you wanted my signature and you didn't know that you were gonna get to an event, you can private message me on Instagram, Carl Delator, and I'll send one out in the mail to you. Okay, good. Oh, that's great. Good idea. Okay. I'm gonna do that right now. Right. Here they are. <laughs> So um, I'm going to say bravo. If we had an audience, I'm sure everybody would be clapping. And um, yeah, that was excellent. That was really excellent. And Catherine, I want to tell you, I have well over, I don't know, a hundred allium that are just getting ready to bloom right now. <laughs> They're so gratifying. So great. I love them. I absolutely love them. So I don't know if George is coming back on. I'm now. back. Okay. I'm back. There you are. I'm, I mean, I'm back. I'm back and I have to say, um, Allium is one of my favorite flowers as well. Um, I just thought the whole presentation was absolutely fascinating. And it's so interesting when you watch and listen to it explained by professionals. Because I know, you know, all designers have an eye or we hope we do. But, you know, we're all good at what we do. And you are obviously so talented at what you what you all do. Um, I had a house in Maine once and thought I knew what I wanted to do with it. And I hired a landscape architect to come in. They listened very patiently to everything I had to say and then came back and did an entirely different presentation. And they were 100% right because they knew what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm just reminded when I look at these grand vistas and for you know those of us in the New York area who are of a certain age, you may remember or know um, Cole Porter or Moss Hart. Um, you know, big Broadway personalities. Um, one of them had a huge estate outside of New York and spent a fortune moving trees, you know, doing the Grand Vista landscape. And somebody came and looked at it and said, yeah, that's what God would have done if he had money. <laughs> so I don't know. That's just my, my parting anecdote. I thought it was really funny. Um, I can't wait to see you all in, in, uh, in Wakefield, and I hope we're going to have some books um, signed here in the shop so that if anybody comes in and is interested in purchasing one, they can just buy it right off the floor. I can't wait to see the book, and I want to thank all of you so much. New England Home, Images and Details, all of our sponsors, and hope we see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Lots of great comments, by the way. <laughs> thank you, everybody, for doing yeah, this, you. and thank you, Carl, for making such a beautiful book. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Carl. We know that we know that wasn't easy. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All Enjoy right. your afternoon, everyone. You too. Thanks again. Take care, everyone. Mm.